Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, future chocolate salesman, father of six and best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going today? J-Love, you are getting better and better, my friend. Chocolate maven. That's what I'm going to be selling. Chocolates too, huh? Always bringing the pain. I'm coming up to sell them with you. Today's <laughs> guest is Kieran Boyle. Kieran is the Commercial Lines Risk Manager for the Spain Agency, located in Westchester County, New York, and he's been working there for 10 years. In his position, he is responsible for overseeing the Commercial Lines Department and coordinating loss control and risk management services. Wow. Look, insurance is one of those areas that people don't want to deal with, but you better be damn sure you get it right. We thought it was important to get an expert on the show to highlight the importance of proper insurance and things to look out for. So without further ado, Kieran, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So happy to have you here, and why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into insurance? Sure. Uh, I've been in insurance now almost 15 years, pretty much right out of college in 2001, 2002. Similar to most people in my field, it's something I kind of just fell into. It's, it's rare that you find an insurance professional actually set out to be in the field. Uh, I, had, I graduated with a degree in business economics and a minor in finance. And right out of college, working through a few head, headhunters, I, uh, I, I interviewed with an insurance brokerage down in Westchester County, and I've been doing it ever since. So you didn't wake up one day and say, Mom, I want to be an insurance broker? <laughs> Thankfully, no. <laughs> okay, just making sure. So I, I have a little disclosure here. I've been doing business with Kieran and his company for about 20 years. Uh, He's a great team member. I, I speak a lot about building teams and building relationships. Um, they're not the cheapest. They're not the most expensive. But you get what you pay for. They have a quality place. Uh, I had to fire my restaurant about four years ago. Um, checks came in the mail without, without skipping a beat. Uh, that's the most important thing with insurance. you got to find out who's paying, and you got to find out you need that service. So when you're comparing insurance companies, that's the first tip I'm going to give you guys. Compare apples to apples. Make sure you're comparing insurance companies that are going to perform for you. A guy can come in, give you a low-ball offer, but just check his track record. Uh, with the Spain Agency, they do a fantastic job. They've been in the business for a long time. They've got a great track record, um, and that's what you really want to look for when it comes to insurance. So, Kieran, let me ask you the first question. Uh, what changes have you seen in this field since uh, 2001? Well, from a real estate standpoint and a property insurance standpoint, ever since 9-11 occurred uh, in 2001, the insurance rates obviously skyrocketed for those initial three to four years after that event. Uh, obviously, as you can expect from all the losses and, and the claim payouts, reinsurance rates skyrocketed, and in turn, all the insurance carriage rates skyrocketed. I think uh, we're at a good point in time now and that the marketplace has, has stabilized for the most part. Similar to most industries, it's very cyclical in the sense that when the market is hard, there's not as much competition or insurance carriers competing on your uh, insurance program. And those that are are offering very significant increased rates. When the market is soft, it's the, the, the delta of that being that there's a lot of insurance carriers trying to compete for your business and the insurance rates come down quite a bit. Every, I'd say, three to five years, you could see the market shift into uh, somewhat of a hardened market. The last hard market we had was probably in the 2000 to 10 to 11 term. Uh, since then, we've, we've uh, come to more of a softer market. And today's marketplace, rates are pretty stable for property insurances. Now, this is the million-dollar question for me. I, how should people go out and select a good insurance broker, and where should they start their search? It's not an exact science. Um, I'd like to say you could just go through the yellow pages and, and find a, a competent broker, but I think it comes down to asking peers in your industry for references. You know, Whoever is uh, a similar business owner, ask who their broker is and how good they've, they've been uh, contributing to their uh, risk management and, and claims management. You can 
um, go online. Obviously, a lot of brokers now market via their websites and, and different marketing tools online. You could, you could check to see what carriers they represent. I think it boils down to does the broker have an in-house claims department, which would equate to, to you knowing they're going to fight for you on behalf of your account for claims. They're going to they're going to get dirty, so to speak. When a claim occurs, you want to make sure that you get paid out timely and you want to make sure that your broker understands your coverage forms to seek where a claim could be paid out versus an insurance carrier just trying to deny the claim. When it comes to market accessibility, you want a broker that has access to virtually all the carriers in the marketplace so they could show you the most options. If, if you contact a broker and say, how, how many carriers do you represent for what I do? and they only list one or two carriers, then they may not be the best option for you. What's a good number there? A number of carriers? Yeah. For instance, uh, you know, we represent 50 to 100 different carriers, depending on what industry you're in. You, you want to have, and it's easy for me to say that, but depending on what industry you're in, i.e., if you're, doing, if you're a real estate uh, owner and, and professional, depending on your territory, you'd like your broker to show you anywhere from you know, four to five options when he, he, he gives you a good shopping in the marketplace. Let me backtrack real quick. What is your specific responsibility at Spain and what do you do there? Well, being a risk manager, um, I kind of wear all different hats. So I get involved from claims management. I get involved, uh, involved from, from a risk management standpoint. If someone needs, you know, safety services or uh, building inspections, I negotiate the rates with the uh, carriers on renewal and new business. I manage some of the staff in-house, and I'm the one doing all the presentations to the clients. So I'm kind of on the road. I'm uh, the face of the agency, so to speak. So when are you going to take the place over? <laughs> uh, that's a good question for my boss. <laughs> well, now that we're part of Brown & Brown, um, Brown & Brown is the fifth largest broker in the world, and we partnered with them. So now we're one of their affiliated offices. Uh, they have 7,500 employees, so now it gives us a little more leverage, a little more juice. Wow, I didn't know they were that big. Yeah. And when did this happen? This occurred last year, This correct? past April. Yeah, where's April. Gino's discount? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't hit him up for that, but now that I heard that, now that he's become, now he's become owner, I think I, uh, that, 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 that call is coming right after this podcast, my <laughs> I friend. this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I mean, everyone probably wants to know this, but what are the biggest mistakes you see investors make when they're buying insurance? Well, I could reiterate what you said earlier in the sense that when you have, maybe it's a new investor or a, a veteran investor, but they could... Uh, discount coverage for a price, meaning they don't care about what's included in their policy forms. All they care about is the bottom line. And that will eventually bite them in the ass, so to speak. Excuse my language. You always want to make sure that you're reviewing your coverage forms with your broker and that they're explaining them to you in detail. Because the last thing you want to know is you saved $2,500 in premium, but you don't have a lot of the different coverage extensions that you should have. And in the event of a claim, you could be out of pocket for something just for saving a couple bucks. Let me ask you, um, <clears throat> real quick, just give me a couple of tips on insurance as far as, give me some of the, some of the terms that investors are going to hear as far as deck pages, as far sure. as deductibles. Mm -hmm. You know, think about reinsurance. Give me a few of those terms and, and just, just uh, mm -hmm. highlight them for me. Your policy declaration page is really the, the, the policy pages that detail your, your limits, your coverages, your deductibles, your premiums. So that you, you're going you're gonna to hear the deck page reference quite a bit. When it comes to what you need to look for or what you should be more detailed about is your building limit obviously is, is – there's a lot that goes into it just in a number. So what I always recommend our clients is that you're getting updated appraisals every few years to make sure you're accounting for the current standards of the, the construction costs of the marketplace. If someone has a building limit of a million dollars and it's been that way for 10 years, that tells me they're not keeping current with the current construction costs of the marketplace and it could hurt them in the event of a claim. Coinsurance is another term that you're probably going to hear quite often. And what that is is a, is a clause that insurance carriers put into place probably 50 years ago and it forces the named insureds, i.e. the consumers, to insure their properties to value. Co-insurance basically means we're making the named insured a co-insurer in the event of a claim where their values aren't appropriate. So if the replacement cost of your building is a million dollars and you only insure it for 700000 the insurance carrier may have an 80% co-insurance clause in your policy. So you have to, at the minimum, 
insure your building to 800000 of the million dollars, right? So let's mm-hmm. say you insure it for 700000 and there's a partial loss. And that partial loss is to the tune of $500,000. They're going to go back on your policy and say, well, you insured it for $700,000. You, ins- you should have insured it for $800,000 minimum. So they're going to penalize your, your claim settlement. And in that event, they take pretty much what you did insure it for divided by what you should have insured it for. And that's the penalty to your claim. So in that scenario I just explained, 700000 divided by 800000 you're looking at 88%. So in a $500,000 loss, they'll pay you 88% of that minus your deductible, which in that case, you know, you're out of, out of pocket roughly $60,000. So in other words, don't be cheap. Correct. For it's, a few bucks in insurance premiums, do it's, not it's be cheap. truly not worth it. And it's easy for me to say that as a broker because, you know, it's, it's not coming out of my pocket and I'm not paying the premium. But out of all the, the claim examples that I've had over the years in my, in my career, it's, you know, the guys are just shaking their heads said, why did I do that? To save a thousand dollars, now I got to pay twenty five thousand dollars out of pocket. Mm-hmm. Any other terms? Uh, from a deductible standpoint, I think it's it's really up to the discretion of the consumer and how much retention you want to or risk you'd like to take. Obviously, you have a large property value. Say you know you have a building that's ten million dollars in value, you could probably afford to take on a bit of a larger deductible. The typical deductibles range anywhere from twenty five hundred to five thousand to ten thousand. Obviously, if you have a larger uh, value in property, a uh, hundred million dollar building, you're probably going to have a minimum of ten to twenty five thousand deductible. Uh, I had the fire four years ago. Can you just talk to them about what loss runs are and how that plays into effect as far as the policy goes? Sure. So, from a rating standpoint, underwriters always look at roughly five years of your loss runs, and loss runs are your claims reports from your carriers from the prior years. They want to see your claims experience. So if you have a high frequency of claims, they're probably going to charge you a higher rate because they feel there's a bigger exposure. You're, you're, you're drawing a lot of claims. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll look at the severity of the claims. If you have, say for your instance, you have, you didn't have a lot of frequency claims. Nope, you had one, one claim. It was a severity loss. Obviously, it was a large fire, uh, but you had one severity in five years. So they take that into account when they're rating your next renewal. So it's important for us as a broker, for you as a consumer, to look at your historical claims experience because that'll give you a good uh, idea of what you can expect future uh, insurance cost-wise. Uh, this is one of Jake's pet peeves, uh, dealing with business entities and what type of entities as far as LLCs or holding it personally. Do you have any advice uh, about how you should hold the stuff and how it affects right. insurance? Obviously, that's, that's more of an accountant tax question, but from an insurance standpoint, I could tell you if you're an LLC, a corporation, an S-corp, you know, it, there's not a huge difference. The only thing I would say is if you owned a piece of property under your personal name, obviously that opens you up to personal liability. And we, we always recommend when investors are purchasing property, property you know, lessers risk properties that, to open up an LLC is usually how you see the real estate holding entities under an LLC format. I, I have a question about that. If, if someone did open a, uh, say it was their first time investment and they, opened, they maybe did a single family residence and they got an umbrella policy on that, they're a sole proprietorship individual, however you want to refer to them, could they get an umbrella and and be named as an additional insured in that umbrella, or is that is that not something that you could do? Absolutely. Depending on the carrier, there are markets out there that are willing to write uh, rental properties that are owned under personal names, as well as offering umbrella policies. And you would be a named insured, not an additional gotcha. insured. Those are two gotcha. different things. So what's the difference between named and additional? A named insured gives you first rights of the policy. So you're the owner of the property you have every first right of that insurance policy. If you're an additional insured, it's almost like a bank or a mortgagee. They Mm -hmm. want to be an additional insured on your policy, which gives them some rights, but not the full rights. So that's going single. So actually, you can have a rental property. So what we're we're, we're coming up against right now is we've got this massive policy that we want to get. We want to get an umbrella policy for the business. Personal umbrella policy does not, has nothing to do with with, that. Correct. Commercial. So if you, you know, you have your homeowners, your auto, you have your personal assets, you may have a personal umbrella to cover all those exposures. But if you own rental properties under an LLC, your personal umbrella uh, typically will not cover any of that exposure. You want to get a separate umbrella policy to cover that. So this is another part where people are cheap and uh, Jake and I probably fall into this. We're, we're, we're tending to get away from that. 
Do you recommend businesses? I know I've got one for my restaurant and I've got one for my other businesses. Mm-hmm. Do you recommend commercial liability umbrella insurance? For Absolutely. It's it's really it's, it coincides with today's litigious society. Mm-hmm. You know, a liability claim is really it's a slip and fall. Someone on your property, you could have a vendor, a delivery guy, what mm-hmm. have you. No matter what the case, uh, if you own a, a multi-unit residential building and and someone comes to visit, they slip in the the, the common area because someone just mopped the floor and they, you know, that's how kind of how it plays out. And an umbrella policy gives you that extra protection because your primary general liability insurance typically is $1 million per occurrence. And if they have an umbrella, it'll give you more leverage. It's and above and beyond. Correct. You know, there's one, one thing that I wanted to talk about. It was uh, loss runs, uh, business interrupted insurance. That business interrupted insurance, I think, is something that we should focus on here for real estate because building burns down, you want to be able to have that income coming in. So I want Kieran to speak about that. Yeah, absolutely. Business interruption insurance is also known as, as, as uh, business income coverage. And what it does is it, it provides insurance coverage for any uh, additional expenses that you incur until you're back in your original space in the event of a property loss. So a perfect example for real estate account, if you own an apartment building or a a co-op condo and there's a severe fire to the tune that the unit owners have to move out for a certain time period, all the maintenance fees that are incurring every month, an insurance policy that has business income coverage would account for that cost. Had you not had it, you're going to be out of pocket for your monthly maintenance fees. In the in the instance of a restaurant, if you have a fire and you're out of business for five months, your business income coverage covers you for lost revenue. Uh, if you have to rent, you still have to pay your payroll. You still have to pay your employees. You have to rent certain equipment. All your additional expenses till you're back in your original space and inhabiting it uh, to its like kind quality prior to the claim. How many people do you see that don't have this coverage? Because, I mean, for me, it's a no-brainer. I mean, maybe anyone listening new to it might not have heard about it. But what do you, what do you see in, in the business as far as business owners? How many don't have this coverage? My clientele, less than 5%. Less than don't 5%. have it. Don't have it. I almost do not. I, you know, even if they don't want it, I'll find a way to throw it on there because we do not like insuring anybody that does not have that coverage. No, because when something happens, they're going to come back to you and say, well, why didn't you tell me or why am I not covered? Of course. You know, that comes back to you. How, how expensive is it? Does it add a lot of money to the policy? As far it, as de- it depends. It, everything's kind of circumstantial on your industry and, and the type of limit you need. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you're a 400 unit condo, your maintenance fees are going to be a lot higher than if you just had a four family unit house. Mm-hmm. And so that would be loss of rents, rent, right? Loss of rents. That's what we're talking about. Correct. Right. Loss yeah. of rents. Yeah. Correct. But that's something that you shouldn't even consider thinking about. That's something that you need in your policy because it's all great until something happens. And then when you don't have rents coming in for six months and you still have to pay the mortgage, then you're really in trouble. Then you're, and then you're, your back's up against the wall basically, you know. Uh, let me ask you: how, how do you how do people know that they've had enough coverage, but are not buying more coverage than they realistically need? Again, appraisals can help you with that because sometimes certain carriers nowadays it's it's almost it's almost always that a carrier has what they call an inflation guard on the policy, so it automatically increases your values roughly two to five percent every year. So it's automatically occurring. But for me, I think appraisals are a good thing because. Construction costs, depending on the territory you live in, they change drastically. You know, it's very cyclical year to year. Um, for, for for myself and for our clientele, we are usually increasing values, not decreasing values on an annual basis. You know, I want to ask you this one question. When I had the fire, I uh, had the fire. Three hours later, I had people calling me. What do they call the adjusters? Public adjusters. Public adjusters. It was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever had in my life. Guys are coming. My, my, my business is up in shambles, and I've got these guys calling me. Can you give uh, the viewers a little sure, bit of advice? Sure. The pros and cons, because obviously they do have a great service, but at the same time, they're expensive, and they're a bit annoying, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. So I think it really <clears throat> depends. As an insurance broker, um, I, I usually advise my clients to let us quarterback the claim along with the insurance carrier. Mm-hmm. In lieu of a public adjuster, because when a public adjuster gets involved, um, you know, although they're working on your behalf, similar to your broker should be, uh, they kind of muddy the waters and it could delay the length of the claim because they're going to go in there. They're going to try and redo, negotiate with the, the, the carrier's adjuster, um, and it, it always gets to a conflict versus if your broker and carrier are quarterbacking it, you know, there's always going to be some negotiation depending on how your your bills are coming in. And how much do they charge, more or less? 
You know, I I don't know that answer to that question because everyone's different. But they could it could be an hourly. It could be they generally they um, get a percentage mm-hmm. of the claim payment. So if you have a huge claim, it could be a decent payday for a public adjuster. Let's you know, it's similar to I hate to say it, but it's similar to you know ambulance chasing attorneys. Uh-huh. They they hear a fire on the news, they're going to drive right to your building. And, and that's what they did with me. So uh, the, the tip that I give everyone uh, is when you have it, the <clears throat> best thing to do is just to get with your insurance agent and to get together with the, with the insurance company. When I had my fire, I mean, I went in the kitchen, I looked at the insurance agent, I looked him in the eyes and I said, listen, I don't want another nickel more than what I need to get this place up and running as soon as possible. And he knew how genuine I was and I wasn't going to milk the insurance company. Whatever it was there, it was there. I even was going to leave my cooking line in there. Although when I took it apart, it just all fell apart. I had to replace it. So if you work with them, you're honest with them, you will get everything that you want. That that was my to- total opinion. I didn't want to work with the adjusters. I just didn't feel a level of confidence with them. I had never worked with them. I had no experience with them. I looked at the insurance agent and the insurance broker right in the eye and said, listen, whatever needs to get done as soon as possible, I want to open up because I need to pay these guys. And that was worked out wonderful for me. And there's a fair listen. There's a lot to be said about having a serious, significant, catastrophic claim. Obviously, you want to get back to to where you were prior to the claim. But public adjusters, again, if they're getting paid off for a percentage of the claim settlement, they're going to keep fighting and fighting and fighting to get more money out of insurance carriers. There's always going to be what's fair and reasonable, and you have to come to a median when it comes to a catastrophic claim. I think for the most part, if your broker represents a lot of reputable carriers and they have their own internal claims department, it should go along pretty smoothly without the help of a public adjuster. Can you give us a list of a couple of reputable carriers that you like to work with? Sure. And again, some of this is circumstantial on the territory and industry you're in. But if we're speaking real estate, um, and you know, I know New York very well. Obviously, we're domiciled here. If it's, if it's a multi-unit property, we like Admiral. Admiral, uh, Admiral a lot. Claremont, you know, it's, a, it's a Warren Buffett company. We like, uh, we like Travelers. We like Philadelphia, uh, Greater New York, Amtrust. Harleysville, Selective, CNA, you know, I, there's probably 10, 15, 20, depending on where you're domiciled, that we would go to. And I've used Travelers and I've used Harleysville, and they've both been really good. Uh, one thing when the insurance guys come out, you know, they're a little difficult. Harleysville is a little difficult to work with because I, they like to mitigate their risk. So when they come out and do an inspection on the restaurant, this is just a tip for you guys, or they come out and do an inspection on your property, they're going to be really tough if they're a good insurance company. These guys are looking at the property with a fine tooth comb. They were going in my driveway, my parking lot. I had grates, you know, where water goes in to the grate of the catch basins. They were like three inches. The guy looks at me, he goes, you shouldn't have those. Someone's high heels might get stuck in them. And in 20 years, I said to myself, I've never heard of anything like this. They look at every little thing. My curb was sagging three or four inches. You should get that fixed. It's amazing the level of detail that they go through. Um, and it's, it's, you know, par for the course. If you want to have a great company and you want to keep your premiums down, that's what it takes. Absolutely. I mean, they get paid to, to look at every nook and cranny of your exposure and go back to underwriting to determine, hey, here's what I think is critical as far as recommendations. We suggest you, you move forward to help mitigate any claims. And again, all, at the end of the day, they're, they're trying to offset and help your business from any claims occurring. It's, it's a positive, but yes, it could be cumbersome on you guys as the owners of the property because sometimes there's a laundry list of recommendations that they want compliance with. And they might not want to do business with you, correct? Absolutely. Has that happened? Is that happening? Absolutely. It could be anything from, you know, during the application process, the, the named insured, i.e. the consumer said, oh, you know, my, my suppression system, our sprinkler system is all up to date. You know, we get it regularly monitored and, and checked on by a, a reputable sprinkler contractor. And, you know, the insurance carrier can come in and, and look that the, it hasn't been updated in two years and it's blocked. It doesn't work. Or, you know, you could tell them that you have two means of egress, there's fire escapes, the guy shows up, but none of that is in place. So there's, there's absolutely instances where there might be misappropriation during the quoting process and the insurance carrier, that's half the reason why they sent someone out to inspect your property, is to confirm all the exposures that were presented to them are accurate. Uh, Kieran, do you recommend paying for attorneys to review insurance policies for investors? I think if you have a reputable broker, you don't need to waste the money um, because it really comes down to someone knowledgeable and has the experience on the coverage forms and terms that are specific to your exposure. So, I mean, I generally 
say it, it, it's 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 not worth it unless you really need it or if you're not comfortable with your broker and you want to get a second look at it then by all means go go ahead if you have an attorney uh, that's on retainer or on staff and it's not going to cost you much and it certainly doesn't hurt as long as he's an expert in the field of reviewing insurance policies. It's funny because Kieran said attorney and much in the same sentence and Jacob and I both know that those two words don't go in the same sentence. They're they're sort of oxymoronic for us. So, (laughs) Uh, What major loopholes do you see, Kieran, or gaps should people look out for when buying insurance for the commercial properties? Well, a lot of it is if you're if you're a new investor and you're you're purchasing a new property, you're almost starting from scratch when it comes to the insurance program. I always recommend our clients to try and get a copy of the current policy in place from the prior owner because it's usually a good a good start for you to review, okay, well what did they have the building insured for or, you know, what did their claims experience look like? What did the prior loss control recommendation look like? It's a good starting point. Uh, to, to, to look at because to tailor a program from from step zero, not knowing any of the prior experience could be uh, could be problematic. And that is one of the tips on due diligence. Uh, when you buy a property, you should get lost runs. What do you? What's your hundred percent? Hundred percent. So if you're in contact with the prior owner or the prior owner's representatives, you want to say, "I need to see five years of claim reports because I want to see historically how this building's been performing from a claim standpoint." Because that will affect your insurance rates when you purchase the property. We haven't come up against this, but I was wondering if you could use this as part of your uh, negotiation. If you see that these insurances are, are really high and they've got high claims, and you know that your insurance should be three thousand bucks a year, and all of a sudden you can't get anything less than eight thousand dollars a year, I'm, I'm assuming you can go back and you can negotiate that and your number down, your sales price down. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. That should be a, that should be an important factor. You know, obviously, if they have repetitive uh, nature of claims, you know, for instance, if they have just faulty workmanship or a, a shop contractor going there to do the maintenance and they have five claims a year all related to the same instance obviously you want to get that nipped in the bud and you could probably work something out during the negotiation of the lease and you could probably use that as part of your due diligence to say listen what's going on with this property why are we having these issues and that's another way to look at your property right absolutely let me ask you one more question big question here what's your best insurance advice for the listeners I don't think it comes down to one piece of advice. You know, it's it's definitely a, a blanket of advice, but you, you want to know what you're insuring. It's really easy. At the end of the day, all I'm giving you is a piece of paper, i.e. your insurance policy. And you guys have no idea what's entailed in that policy, nor should you. Obviously, you're not in the business of it. You have to trust a broker to explain and educate you on what you're buying. But The one piece of advice I would give is to consistently review your policy with your broker every year to ensure that any changes in your property um, are being fully explained and and thought out well. Because an insurance policy shouldn't be the same every year, year in, year out. Obviously, you could have different tenants coming in. You could be hiring different construction companies or vendors that visit your property, which tie into risk transfer and how you can obviously uh, avoid a, a potential catastrophic claim. So for me, it would be consistently review your policy with your broker and advise them of any changes and exposures that occur every year. Don't get complacent with just renewing every year, not reviewing it, not identifying anything new from an exposure standpoint with your broker. I want to circle back around to uh, when we were talking about pricing and, and not buying too much coverage but not underinsuring. What's your guidance when it comes to umbrella policies uh, in terms of how much uh, someone should buy? Mm -hmm. It really depends on, I think, the exposure. So if you have a very large property with a lot of foot traffic, you should probably be securing a higher umbrella limit. I'd say the average umbrella limit, if you're a small multifamily and you only own one house, you probably have a one or two million umbrella policy. If you own 10 multi-unit houses, Maybe you have a $5 million umbrella policy. If you own four commercial office buildings that are fifty to 80,000 square feet, you probably have a minimum of a $10 million umbrella. So it really depends on what type of exposure is there and how much extra 
limit you want from a liability standpoint. And talk about the premiums. What we're noticing is we've got a $10 million umbrella policy right now, and we're going up to 675 units, which we've grown, grown dramatically. And we're up against it. We're thinking of creating an obligated member LLC, which is going to put us at, at, at personal risk, but we're doing it to save taxes. Mm-hmm. And so we're weighing both options. Now, we're going from $10 million to possibly up to $30 million. What does that do for premiums? Premiums don't shoot up that much, do the they? The most expensive uh, layer of an umbrella is going to be the first $5 million in limits. Okay. So as you exceed that and go higher and higher, each layer is uh, decreased in price, and the rates are not as high as they would be for the first $5 million. It's amazing how much less it is from 10 to 30 Absolutely. I could get you, you know, we, we, we insure over 250 high-rise condo co-ops in Manhattan. And I'd say 95% of those buildings have a $100 million umbrella. We can offer a $200 million umbrella, which in some cases is just window dressing. But going from $100 million to $200 million, you'd be shocked to see the minimal amount of premium it costs for an extra $100 million of coverage. So mm-hmm. I could see your point, absolutely. And it, it's really a market-specific. Because down in Tennessee, $30 million of coverage is going to get you a lot of coverage. But in Manhattan, $30 million is not going to get you anything. Absolutely. You know? It ties into what juries are awarding in your specific state. And unfortunately, New York is, is known as probably the worst state from an insurance state. New York and California are the most litigious states in the country. Why are you laughing, Jake? You're killing me. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's why I got out, man. I'm done with it. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> it's my pet peeve. Insurance, Bye-bye. taxes, weather. Yeah. Jake's killing me here. Uh, we're going to go over to these short answer questions real quick. Jake, shoot. Sure. So uh, what is your best habit for success? That's a good question. I would say just being vigilant in all aspects of my business. You know, communication is key for me, so I always want to be communicating with my clients, educating them on what they're purchasing, the trends in the marketplace, how my industry may be changing, uh, what new carriers are being presented to the marketplace. So communication for me is key. Everything, everything that I know, I want my clients to know whether they want to or not. You know, I think educating them on, on what we do uh, is important. I think that's a a good trait for an insurance broker. What is your biggest mistake in the business? Ah, wow. Be honest now. Be honest. On the spot. (laughs) Biggest mistake. Um, hmm. I guess personally, maybe not diversifying uh, my book of business in that uh, in the past 15 years, although I have clients in, in literally every industry. My focus has always been on construction, real estate, and municipality insurance. I wish my book was a little more diversified throughout different industries, uh, just long term. Uh, I think that's better for my career. So I guess that's a selfish answer for you. (laughs) Nothing wrong with a specialist, okay? So what's your favorite business book that you've read? Uh, probably the, the the wedge for success, which is probably one of the first uh, uh, sales uh, industry books I read coming out of college, specific to insurance. Um, but it was by a, a and I forget his name, but it was by an insurance instructor uh, that has since passed away. Um, but to me, I learned a lot of uh, a lot of tools, so to speak, to I think become successful early on. Hey Jake, it's funny because. Kieran's Irish, and he read the book The Wedge. I'm Italian. When I hear the word wedge, I think of food. <laughs> Kieran thinks of a book, so there you go. I'm already getting hungry here with The Wedge. Hey, you're getting, <laughs> you're getting marinara toward... sauce right in front of me. Almost <laughs> lunchtime. Here we go. It's funny, Jake. The New Yorkers know what wedge is. Uh, you know, some people call it grinders, heroes, heroes subs. Yeah. We call it wedges We're up wedge. here. I'm so I'm already guy. thinking of food here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So how can people reach you? Uh, via email. My email address is kboyle.com. B as in boy, O-Y-L-E, at Spain, I-N-S dot com. Spain spelled out like the country, I-N as in Nancy, S dot com. I just want to say there's a few takeaways uh, from today's uh, discussion that I just thought were extremely important. And one is don't overpay, but don't be cheap because it's going to come back to bite you. And I think uh, you explained that very well. So we appreciate that. And make sure you have loss of rents uh when, when you're uh, getting into multifamily because if something happens and you don't, you're going to be regretting that. And know what you're insuring. I thought that was a great uh, statement that you made and review your policies annually. Do you want to add anything else uh, as, a, as a final takeaway for the listeners? Well, uh, from a marketplace standpoint, keep 
keep your broker on your toes. And, and, and I shouldn't be saying that because other brokers will punch me in the face. But, no, i got to um, get these guys working for you. Come on now. It's absolutely. Really like- Listen, Gino's, Gino's tested me, and as he should. As a business owner, you, you do want to get second opinions every few years just to make sure your broker is not being complacent. And the marketplace is very cyclical. I talked about hardening and softening markets. You could see if, if you've been in an investment standpoint from real estate and, and you've had policies throughout the years, you, you'll see your carriers change every three to five years because carriers jump in the pool, they gain market share, and then when the claims exceed their premiums, they jump out of the pool and then different carriers jump in. So it, it is very cyclical. It's something you got to stay on top of to make sure you're, you're not only getting the best bang for your buck, but you're obtaining the broadest coverage forms to make sure you're protected and you can sleep at night. I like peace of mind. Definitely. Don't we all? Kieran, really good advice. Appreciate your time, and thank you very much. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.